When you hear the words drug addict, what thoughts come to mind? Dirty, smelly, scary, homeless? If you had any of those thoughts, you're not alone. The World Health Organization actually studies how we perceive diseases, and it's determined that drug addiction is one of the most stigmatizing diseases in the world. And yet, drug addiction is one of the most common diseases in the world. Every one of you in this audience knows a drug addict, either at work, in your neighborhood, maybe in your house. Maybe you have suffered with a disease of addiction. So about this time, you're probably wondering, am I in the right talk, the one about your brain and happiness? Uh, yes, you are. We are going to talk about techniques to build happier, better brains. We will practice techniques. But you need to know the techniques we'll be practicing, I've learned mostly from drug addicts. I'm a psychiatrist, and I treat people who have substance use disorders and mental illness. And I have a front row seat. I have witnessed the dramatic transformations, the brain growth of these very, very brave people. The best way for me to illustrate what I have witnessed is to tell you about a patient that I treat. A few weeks ago, in my office, I saw Michael. And he had just come back from his dream, uh, dream uh, vacation to the Grand Canyon. He traveled with his girlfriend. While they were away, they got engaged. And he was in the office remarkably happy, so deeply connected to this other woman. He had an abundant sense of well-being. And I remember thinking, this is what I've always wished for Michael. It was profoundly powerful for me, because forever etched in my mind is the Michael I met five years previously. That Michael had just tried to kill himself. Now, how could someone so abundantly happy be so desperate, so hopeless? If you had known him in high school, you never would have predicted that he would be suicidal. He was popular, good student. He was one of the stars of the varsity soccer team. He was the kind of brother that we all wish we have, uh, not just at home, but in school, too. And he once told me the story uh, that, that showed that. He, he talked about how after school he would practice soccer, and he noticed this boy who was always there watching. And he would be there every day, and at some point Michael said, I'll, I'm going to introduce myself to him. And as Michael did that, he realized, this boy is different. He speaks differently. He moves differently. He has a developmental disability. Now, most people, especially teenagers, they don't like different. That would be the time to split, to disengage. But not Michael. He decided, I'm going to help this boy. And so every day after school, after his own practice, Michael practiced with this boy. And he taught him how to play soccer. He taught him how to be more athletic. And in the process, he taught him how to be more confident. So much so that next year, the boy competed in the Special Olympics. And that was Michael's payoff, because when the boy won a medal, Michael said it was like he had won a medal. He learned that his act of kindness gave him a payoff, too. A few months after that, Michael had a dramatic setback. He was playing on, on soccer, and he injured his knee. He was out for the season. He needed knee surgery. When he left the hospital, he returned with a vial of Percocet. That vial of Percocet eased his knee pain, but he also recognized it eased my emotional pain when I'm sitting on the bench. That vial of Percocet initiated a series of lines drawn in the sand and then crossed. Lines in the sand, then crossed. I'll only use these when I'm at the game. I'll only use these until the vial runs out. I'll only buy these from people I know. Until he was so addicted, Michael realized, I need these pills every day just to function. And they're expensive. At some point, he couldn't afford them. And that's when he crossed another line. I'll never use heroin. 
And as his addiction to heroin got stronger and stronger, the parts of his life that really mattered, that defined him, his friends, his family, his future, they all became like whispers next to the roar of heroin. And, you know, Michael knew better. He wanted to stop. He tried to stop, but he couldn't stop. And that's when he realized, I can stop. If I kill myself, I will stop. Fortunately for Michael, he lived. And as he recovered, he got help. And he had this, this slight shift in his mind. Maybe it will get better. He had hope. And that hope became the seed for his dramatic transformation. Now, people who know Michael often think of that transformation as a miracle. Perhaps it is a miracle. But if so, it's a miracle that's grounded in science. Because as Michael changed his life, he changed his brain. Now, fortunately, most of us will never suffer a hellish addiction like Michael's, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get some of the good stuff, the transformation, the brain changing that Michael had in the process? And we can do it. Those are those techniques. Um, this is where the brain comes in. Uh, we need to do a little tour of the equipment we need for that transformation. You all came prepared. Thank you. I brought one extra for myself. This is what it looks like. The top, the bottom, the front, the back. And I'm just going to peel away half of it and give you a quick tour, as I said. If we look at the bottom, this little stem, it's actually called the brain stem. It comes pre-programmed, just like a new computer. So when we're born, it breathes for us. It sets our pulse. It regulates our heart rate and, and our um, blood pressure. It can be a blessing when we're driving home late at night and we don't want to fall asleep, or a curse when we're trying to sleep and it, you know, uh, keep, we, we keep worrying and we can't sleep. It was a blessing for Michael when he overdosed. This part of his brain kept him alive. It kept him breathing. It was a curse when he had cravings and it wouldn't let him fall asleep until he address those cravings. He had to satisfy those cravings first. One jump up is the limbic system. Some people call this our rat brain because we share it with all other mammals. It also comes pre-programmed. It's the part where we have the fight or flight response. And this was life-saving for our prehistoric ancestors because back then people were most likely to die from sudden catastrophic events. You wanted a very aware, alert fight or flight system that would prepare for disaster, anticipate attack. But now there's no caveman with a club, there's no saber-toothed tiger, but our, our fight or flight is still on the alert. This is why we're experts at rehashing and rehearsing, preparing for disaster, holding on to perceived threats, holding on to grudges. If we do nothing to change our brain, it has a negative default bias. That is its programming. We can change that, but it takes some work. One step up, the last area I want to talk to you about is the cortex. This is the most advanced part of the brain in the front. It knows better. It is not stuck in prehistoric times. It's the part where we think rationally, we think about consequences, we, we apply logic. Some people call it our CEO of the rest of the brain. It's, it's the strongest part when it's function, functioning optimally. The catch is it's not fully developed until we're 25. And that is why adolescents behave like, well, adolescents. Uh, they are impulsive and don't think of consequences. That is why when Michael was an adolescent, he was so vulnerable to drugs because his CEO was not fully intact, fully functional. It was hijacked by more primitive structures. And so his CEO didn't get him to the Grand Canyon. Instead, it got him to the closest drug dealer. It was hijacked. And if we're honest with ourselves, We've all been hijacked at times. We know better, and yet we compulsively eat, drink, shop, 
surf the net, watch TV. We know better and we do it anyway. But there's hope. There is a lot of hope. We can change our brains. This is the part where we will practice those techniques, so I'll need your help with this. I'll put my extra brain down. And what we will do is practice techniques. I'll tell you uh, the, the parts of the techniques, and then we'll actually practice them together. So technique num number one, I'll be asking you to stand up, look at the person next to you, uh, in the eyes, shake hands, and introduce yourselves. Or, this is one of two options, stand up, look at the person next to you, and give them a really good hug. I see a group of, of sensational huggers. Addicts like Michael have been doing this for decades. Because they, what do they do when they get sober? They go to meetings. What do they do at meetings? They say, hi, I'm Michael, and I'm an addict. They introduce themselves. At the end of the meeting, they hold hands or they hug. And whether you're Michael or sitting here in the audience, you did something really great for your brain. You released a hormone called oxytocin. It is like the trifecta of feel-good hormones. When we release it, we feel happy. We feel connected and we have a sense of well-being. We need oxytocin to have a sense of social connection. And what I personally think is so cool about oxytocin is you get a release if you hug your dog, you hug your cat, uh, we get oxytocin. So the lesson is to feel good and happy, just you know, hug away. And you can thank oxytocin for that warm feeling you will get inside. Okay, good job. Technique number one. Technique number two, the person you just met or hugged, or maybe you did both, I don't know. Um, I'd like you to think about that person. Think about them and think something positive, something you really like about them. Hold that thought, it could be anything, and now I want you to get up and share that positive thought with that other person right now. Go for it. You all just committed an act of kindness. For Michael, acts of kindness were essential to his recovery, whether making coffee at meetings, mentoring other addicts, or even going to jail and being a role model for them. Acts of kindness helped his brain to feel happy again. What happens when we commit acts of kindness? Well, that really scary cave person sitting next to you becomes a very kind member of your clan. We change that negative default bias, that program in our brains that perceives enemies and disaster and attack to one that perceives kindness and friendship. So you did a wonderful thing for your brains. And when we do that, there is a positive result. We lower our cortisol levels. Our cortisol levels are too high in our brains. We are too stressed. This is why uh, cortisol is meant for quick, quick escapes, for sudden attacks. Cortisol should be released and then we survive or die. Because of our chronic rehashing and rehearsing, our cortisol levels stay chronically high and it's actually toxic to our brains. By committing acts of kindness, cortisol levels go down. We're less stressed, we have a sense of well-being, and we're happier. One more thing about acts of kindness. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I know when I commit an act of kindness, not only does the recipient feel happier, I do too. And there's some science behind that. We both get a dose of a, a chemical called dopamine. Dopamine is our brain's reward neurotransmitter, reward chemical. And it's a very natural, wonderful way to get a nice little dose together to share that. And the more we do that, the less likely we are to pursue unnatural, unsustainable doses of dopamine by that compulsive eating, shopping, drinking, consuming TV, you know, all, I don't have to tell you all the things we can do. So acts of kindness, Dopamine, healing your brain, low cortisol, make sure to commit to acts of kindness. Your brain will thank you. Okay, we have two other techniques. Let's do this one. You have a choice again. You can either stand up and march in place to the count of five, 
or you can stand up and do the twist to a count of five. So stand up, let's go, we'll do it together. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. You can do more later. I know that some people want to keep twisting. Now, I have a confession to make. People who are addicts do not march, and they really never twist. Okay? But they have a wonderful expression, which is, move a muscle, change a thought. Move a muscle, change a thought. And they are so right, because when we exercise, we release this chemical called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It is the equivalent of miracle grow for our brain cells. So when we exercise, this BDNF stimulates our brain cells to connect together, to speak to each other. Brains that exercise have healthier brain cells. They're actually bigger. They're better able to function. They're less prone to depression, less prone to anxiety, and uh, resistant to dementia. Okay, this is the very last exercise. We've all heard the expression, one day at a time. This is a variation on that. One moment at a time, or one breath at a time. That's meditation. What happens when we meditate? We change our brains for the good. It's been shown from brain scans that when we meditate, the cortex, remember the, the CEO, the part that rules for the good, becomes thicker. It's better able to control the more primitive parts of our brain. And it does something else when we meditate that's so vital. It quiets a specific part of the rat brain, our amygdala. You know what the amygdala does? It makes us afraid. This is our fear center. When we meditate, the volume of our amygdala, of our fear, diminishes dramatically. This also leads to lowering cortisol, that stress hormone. It makes us better able to savor the happiness that life serves us. So we'll do a brief uh, practice of meditation, and it's very simple. I'm going to ask you to just get comfortable and breathe. Focus on your breath. Become aware of your breath. Close your eyes, and if you have any intrusive thoughts, let them float by just like a cloud. So I'm asking you to breathe and focus on that sensation. Beautiful job. OK, we've completed our techniques. And in the process, we have built better brains to optimize happiness, connection, and well-being. Keep going. Continue on this path. Tonight, when you go home, make sure to do a little twist hug your dog, and breathe, okay? Because that's how we change our brains for the good. One breath, one act of kindness, one hug at a time. Thank you.